Hello, and thank you for joining us. My name is Natalie Ha, and I am a Community Engagement Library Associate at the Halton Hills Public Library, and I will be acting as your host for this video lecture. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that we are all joining from different communities and recognize that we are all residing in different treaty territories. I am joining from the Halton Hills Public Library, which is located on the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation on Treaty 19. Treaty 19 was agreed upon by the Mississaugas of the Credit and the British Crown in 1818. We recognize this land as being the home and traditional territory to other Indigenous peoples since time immemorial. Joining us today is Dr. Courtney Cito. Dr. Cito is an assistant professor in the School of Kinesiology and Health Studies at Queen's University. She has published widely on racism in hockey, including her award-winning book, Changing on the Fly, Hockey Through Those Voices of South Asian Canadians, and the publicly available policy paper for anti-racism in Canadian hockey. Dr. Cito runs anti-racism education for the Professional Women's Hockey Player Association and consults with the Hockey Diversity Alliance and Black Girl Hockey Club. Please welcome us in joining Dr. Courtney Cito. Thank you so much for having me. So today's lecture will be run as an interview style, um, but why don't you begin by telling us a little bit about yourself and your personal history with hockey and what inspired you to pursue your research in hockey? Sure. So I'm born and raised uh, in Vancouver and now based in Kingston. Um, only child. And so I didn't necessarily have hockey in the house growing up. It's not like I had older siblings or people that I followed to the rink, which I feel is how a lot of people get into the game. Um, neither of my parents played. But somehow hockey kind of chose me. It just, uh, it spoke to me in some way at a very young age. Um, I got my first hockey sticks when I was about seven years old for a birthday present. Um, I think I went to my first Canucks game around that time. And I was just kind of hooked ever since. Um, I wanted to play girls hockey at that time, but it, there just wasn't a lot of opportunities. And I ended up playing other sports. And then when I was about 21 years old, I realized that I could live out this childhood dream of getting to play hockey. So I've been playing uh, women's league ever since then. Um, and yeah, the research project came about when, when I was doing my master's research, I was more focused on tennis and I had been a competitive tennis player. And once I was in the academy, I saw other people doing research around hockey. And I was like, that never even occurred to me. I was like, that looks super fun. Um, so when I was coming up with a project, I was trying to figure out a way that I could hang out at the rink, really. Um, and Hockey Night Punjabi was something that I stumbled upon at that time. Um, the Hockey is for Everyone campaign was floating around. And the film Breakaway had just debuted at TIFF. I think that was around 2011. So there seemed to be some sort of broader narrative around South Asian experiences in hockey. And I thought maybe I could be somebody who helps tell this story and amplify um, these experiences. And, and that's kind of how we got here today. Yeah. So some of the research that you've done has been used to help found the We Are Hockey exhibit. Uh, which is currently being shown at the Peel Art Galleries and Museums and Archives. Um, so what's the process of taking your research and turning that into the exhibit? Yeah, so the art exhibit comes out of one specific chapter from my thesis and my book around public memory. And it was something that I had never really learned about in school or thought about previously that our institutions of public memory, such as halls of fame and museums, have political um, undertones to them, right? Like who creates them and how do we decide what is included, what is excluded, which stories we tell. And this was really kind of eye-opening for me with respect to thinking about the Hockey Hall of Fame. Um, so I advocate for uh, a more comprehensive telling of hockey history and the people who have contributed to the game and its heroes, um, who we don't necessarily see walking through um, places like the Hockey Hall of Fame or other sports halls of fame. And so I had read about do-it-yourself institutions um, to create public memory in that way. And I reached out to the Sikh Heritage Museum in Abbotsford and they were just super helpful. Um, and they basically did all the work for me. They, I gave them uh, kind of my research and, and a historical timeline and they went away and created uh, an excellent exhibit that um, 
is now kind of creating its own life in, in Peel and Brampton. Um, and hopefully other communities will pick it up afterwards and add their own local flair to it as well. So it is really about highlighting racialized contributions to the game um, and allowing especially youth to see themselves as part of the hockey space. Um, and yeah, adding, adding different narratives to what we thought we knew about hockey. Yeah, for sure. And it's kind of along the lines of what we thought we knew about hockey. We often talk about hockey as being Canada's sport, but one of the issues that you look at in your research is whether this idea of hockey being for everyone is actually true. Um, can you kind of speak more to the idea of hockey as being for everyone and some of the challenges that are associated with it? Yeah, the hockey is for everyone tagline, I think, is, is more aspirational than it is um, factual as to the current situation. Um, I think historically hockey has actually been too inclusive in that we have tried to walk the middle line and appease um, both right wing and alt right um, conservative views and tried to um, progress and grow the game with inviting traditionally marginalized groups into that space as well. And that just creates for a very um, problematic and sometimes violent space in hockey because um, to do social justice work, you have to be exclusive at some point. They, you, there has to be a line where you say, these people cannot be here, um, otherwise it's an unsafe space. Um, and we saw that with Eric Trump kind of supporting the NHL when players decided not to kneel and every other sports league had athletes kneeling for Black Lives Matter. Um, so that's the kind of space that hockey has tried to negotiate. And I would say not very well is to appease the conservative fan base and also try to grow the game. Um, at some point, I think you have to make the decision as to who your core fan base is going to be. Um, and the NHL has has struggled in trying to, to negotiate those two things, I think. Mm -hmm. And what would your kind of recommendations be for moving forward? Because it is a challenging space to navigate as we move forward. Uh, what were some of your recommendations be? Um, better mechanisms of accountability for sure. Um, when that can inv involve, um, anti-racism education and clear policies as to what happens when there is a racist incident, what, what counts as racism in and around the rank. I think that that there needs to be a lot of education around that. Um, changing the people is actually the fastest way that you can create change. And we've seen that with the, um, Hockey Canada board, we've had to have wholesale change at that level and, and a, I think in a, a positive direction. Um, I think hockey also needs to focus beyond the player pool. Um, I think hockey thinks about growing the game in a very specific way and it is about getting more youth playing the game. But in order to have a sustainable hockey system, you need to think about all ages. So inviting new adults into the game as well. There's not a lot of infrastructure around that. Um, but also we want people to work in the space of hockey as officials, as coaches, as team doctors, as equipment managers, as media. Um, so diversifying those areas as well will go a long way to facilitating that diversity on, on the ice um, and retaining people. And I think that retention is, um, a much better marker for success. Um, I think it's quite easy to, to invite people in and they get to try hockey and they maybe do it for one season, but if they don't stick around, um, then that's telling you a lot about what the, the space is like. Mm -hmm. um, and what are some of the challenges that you think are leading to these issues with retention? Um, yeah, negative experiences, uh, certainly part of it. Um, the exorbitant costs of hockey, they're just astronomical at this point. Um, and that there isn't a pipeline for women's hockey beyond university is also a problem. So um, where men can continue to play in various leagues, whether it's in Europe or the United States and um, have a bit of a semi-professional career and, and live out their athletic potential. We tell young women that 22 is good enough. You've played enough hockey in your life and you're done. Um, and certainly we're working um, towards changing that with the Premier Hockey Federation and the PWHPA, uh, but for too long, it has been um, 
very okay in Canada to be like, you either play on the Olympic team if you play women's hockey or you don't play hockey at all. Um, so these are some of the bigger issues that go with um, retaining and growing hockey too. Yeah. And you've mentioned that uh, hockey media a few times and you look at the impact of sports media, such as Hockey Nude in Canada, Punjabi. Um, but when testing that out, um, I know they had tested out different versions of that. So they also tested versions in Mandarin and Cantonese and Italian and enough to, but also the Punjabi version was the only version successful enough to proceed with kind of weekly broadcasts. Um, can you speak a little more about the impact of Hockey Night in uh, Canada Punjabi um, and kind of what you think the future of hockey media can look like? Yeah, Hockey Night Punjabi has been um, a really interesting media creation for us in Canada. And I think that one of the important things it's done for the Punjabi community in particular that even the broadcasters hadn't anticipated is that it has created intergenerational connection within households. Um, mm -hmm. That grandma and grandpa can now sit down and watch a game with their grandchildren and um, sharing that experience over um, their native tongue is extremely important. I think there's a lot of elderly folks who felt like they were just disconnected from the younger generations and getting kind of left out. And so hockey has become a very important connection point um, within families, which is pretty cool. Um, and it's also created a different line, a new line of career opportunities for young South Asians, too, that you can be like, OK, there's only so many spots for me to work on Hockey Night in Canada or TSN. Uh, but we now have a, an entire different creation um, that I can still commentate the sport that I love and talk about it and work in that space, but in a different language. Um, so that's super interesting and also a difficult task too, because most people, I think, um, to speak another language is challenging, to do it in sports and live time, that's a huge ask as well. Um, and I've learned from the Hockey Night Punjabi commentators that they need to practice. Um, before each season, they kind of start playing, I think it's like they play NHL on the video game and speak in Punjabi to get themselves back into that space of um, the language that is needed, the, the pace at which you have to be able to think. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that's a that's a huge um, skill set to develop as well. Um, so what the future looks like, I'm not entirely sure. Um, we have a Cree broadcast, I think that's coming up as well. And that's happened a couple of times. Um, I think it's extremely important with respect to preservation of language and culture to have these opportunities. Um, in the United States, Spanish commentary is certainly uh, well established in various sports. So I think, uh, I hope that the future means that we get more opportunities and, and more ways to share the game. Um, but the longevity of it is definitely hard to know in Canada. I mean, we don't even necessarily have that much French opportunities um, and, and tele televising. So um, to say that we're gonna do that in, in Mandarin or um, other, other languages, uh, I think it's a tough sell at this point. Mm -hmm. So uh, kind of one of our themes at the library this year is our One Book, One Halton Hill selection, uh, which is Willie by Willie O'Ree. And so Willie O'Ree was the first Black hockey player to play in the NHL. Um, he's also profiled in the We Are Hockey exhibit. Um, can you speak a little bit about his impact on the sport and kind of his legacy? Yeah, I think Willie O'Ree is an interesting character and certainly his personal narrative about um, kind of playing through his visual impairment is um, kind of mind blowing that anybody could play a game as fast as hockey with that kind of a disability. Um, and what he's done for the game, especially with the working with the NHL now and growing youth programs is um, extremely commendable. And um, we have to tip our hats to, to all the work that he's done in the community. But I also think that Willie O'Ree in some ways takes up a lot of space around the discussion of um, somebody who broke the color barrier in hockey, which is not actually true because Larry Kwong um, was the first uh, racialized player 
to play in the NHL in 1948, so 10 years before Willie O'Ree. But if we compare the amount of media attention that each player gets, it's quite different. Uh, arguably, because Willie O'Ree had a longer career in the NHL than, than Larry Kwong, I certainly understand that. Um, but when we were creating the We Are Hockey exhibit, we also received an email from somebody who said, hey, what about Taffy Abel? Why, why haven't you included him in the, the exhibit? And Taffy Abel, uh, was an Ojibwe player, and he played with the New York Rangers in 1926. The only difference, or a significant difference, is that he passed as white, and he played as white because he couldn't be Indigenous and play in the league at that time. So that also kind of complicates the narrative of who broke the color barrier and how we measure these kinds of firsts. Um, and in hockey, it tends to be uh, a little bit more messy than say Jackie Robinson in baseball. So yeah, I think it's great that Willie O'Ree has um, like, we have community hero awards and things um, from his legacy. Uh, but I think that sometimes he does overshadow other contributions to the game as well. And so I hope that people who are reading his book also look into um, other lesser told stories as well. Mm -hmm. And the We Are Hockey exhibit does a wonderful job at highlighting um, some of those other experiences that um, not, aren't necessarily as highlighted as often. Um, but uh, kind of along those lines of, it did take a while for Willie Uri to get into the Hockey Hall of Fame as well. And that's something that you had talked about as well, um, is the significance of institutions like the Hockey Hall of Fame. Um, kind of, why do you think it's such a challenge for us to highlight these other experiences? And, like, what more can we do to continue highlighting these experiences in the future? Yeah, like the the induction of Willie O'Ree and Herb Carnegie took a lot of campaigning, um, mm -hmm. which is interesting in and of itself that you can campaign for somebody to be in the Hall of Fame. And I'm not saying it's wrong, but I think that there there's politics that go into all of the inclusion and exclusion criteria. And Dr. Bruce Kidd at the University of Toronto, I think, has has highlighted the fact that perhaps the Hockey of Fame, Hall of Fame is really more the NHL Hall of Fame um, and doesn't necessarily take a broad look at hockey in and of itself. So the Hall of Fame definitely serves to legitimize who it is that we memorialize and, and put on a pedestal, but it's not um, necessarily representative of hockey's history um, and the people we should be celebrating as a whole. Um, so sometimes I think maybe those those grassroots campaigns to to get certain people recognized is um, probably a good way to get the institution to think differently. Um, and the selection criteria that they set out, um, I think, can be changed quite a bit too. Um, like we have uh, a quota on the number of women who can be inducted in a year. One would think if you have enough good women in a year that you would induct as many as you needed to. Um, but I think we are limited at two um, each year. So like things like that are not particularly helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And kind of on the lines of those grassroots campaigns. So um, what can so we I think a lot of times look towards institutions for change. But what can everyone from like minor league hockey players to um, we as fans and spectators, what can we kind of do to help diversify the sport and make sure that these narratives are being highlighted? Yeah, so I think part of it is um, demanding change from, from these institutions. So whether it is um, tweeting at Facebook, whatever, the Hockey Hall of Fame, making your voice heard as to um, what it is that you want to see, um, what you don't want to see in these kinds of halls of fame or um, events. Um, I think supporting grassroots organizations like Black Girl Hockey Club Canada and the work that they do can go a long way um, to creating more diverse uh, situations in and around the rink. Um, doing self-education is certainly important. Um, the, at this point, there's a lot of labor putting being put on racialized shoulders to teach um, white folks about the history of hockey, about what racism is, what it is that they can do um, to be the difference. And there's plenty of information on the internet uh, at a quick Google away, plenty of resources and things like the policy paper that we have created um, in 2020 is uh, available as a free PDF. Um, so I think 
coming to the table with some education uh, is a good way to start. Um, donating your money and time and uh, challenging any racist comments that you see at the rink, um, that you see in the media, is it's a good way to kind of get started with creating a different kind of hockey culture. Well, thank you very much for joining us today, Dr. Sita. We really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us about your work and the We Are Hockey exhibit. Um, so again, We Are Hockey is currently being shown at the Peel Art Gallery and Museum until April 30th. And the One Book, One Halton Hill selection for 2023 is Willie by Willie O'Ree and is available to check out from the Halton Hill Public Library. And stay tuned to our website and social media for additional programs that will complement the themes covered in Willie. Okay. Thanks, um, folks. Go check out the exhibit. Thank you so much.